The Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, one of the largest banks in America and the second largest bank to ever collapse. Let's talk about why it happened and why it probably doesn't matter and how it affects real estate. And as I've said times before, I'm a retired investment banker turned real estate agent. And back in my day, I traded subprime residential mortgage backed securities and got a front seat ticket to the banking collapse of 2007. I say 2007 because that's really when it all started. From the time I wrote all of this out to shooting this video, a great deal has changed. My initial precipice was that the government would bail them out. And well, I was correct. However, the how they were going to do it was actually wrong. I'm going to dig into that in a couple moments in a lot more detail because, well, that matters. So Silicon Valley Bank, the 16th largest bank in the United States based on deposits has collapsed with FDIC taking receivership. Now, SVB Bank has long been viewed as the bank at the heart of the U.S. startup industry due to its singular focus on venture capital firms. While the 16th largest bank, it sounds big, it was still considered a smaller bank. And this is thanks to years of consolidation as well as a primary result of the financial crisis back in 2008. So why did SVB go under? First, it's important to remember that while a bank is holding on to your deposit, they're not actually just holding on to that cash. This is called fractional reserve banking. It's not just an SVB thing, it's all banks. So a bank will take that cash and then invest it in what they deem as safe security. In the meantime, they're gonna pay you that 1% on that deposit, well, maybe making three or 4% on that investment. This is the primary way on how banks make money. Now, SVB is no different than other banks. They purchase longer term minimal risk fixed rate maturities like government treasuries as well as mortgage-backed securities that are considered stable and relatively liquid, especially when the Fed was buying them all which we're actually gonna talk about more momentarily. So what happened? Small banks like SVP were unprepared for the fast increases of the Federal Reserve fund rates. Rates have never increased this fast and this aggressively in our history. Larger banks have more room for cover, but don't mistake thinking that this is only an SVB thing that has this issue. This is an issue for the majority of smaller banks out there. You could be asking how they were so stupid, but keep in mind that the Fed's policy for the last 13 years has essentially been a zero rate policy. The issues we're facing now is a result of the free money policy and overspending from our government, which caused the runaway inflation and in turn made for an environment for large rate hikes and fast. Essentially, our roosters, well, they've come home to roost. Long story less complicated is that these banks are holding onto securities that are paying a fixed, call it 3%, when the Fed is now raising in the 5% range. SVP sold some securities last quarter to adjust their balance sheet, which led to a $1.8 billion loss. They actually did this to boost the liquidity position, which is raw and irony because boosting the liquidity position is what could have been the main trigger that caused the run and then, well, their collapse. As it stood, things were not bad. $1.8 billion loss sounds bad, but it was a rather modest loss. Remember when I mentioned that it was a startup centric bank? Well, this all started when several prominent venture capitalists started advising their tech startups to withdraw money from the bank on Thursday. But then JP Morgan Chase jumped into the action, actively trying to convince some SVB customers to move their funds, touting the safety of their assets. Then we probably now all know the story that investors and depositors reacted by initiating withdrawals of $42 billion in deposits from the bank. This means that in just a few hours, a historic bank run drained a quarter of the bank's funding. That's $4.2 billion per hour or more than $1 million per second for 10 hours straight historic. What is kind of amazing and actually pretty impressive is that after this run, the bank was left with a negative cash balance of $958 million. Again, after a $42 billion run in just a matter of hours. To put this in perspective, the previous largest bank run in modern US history took place at Washington Mutual Bank in 2008 and totaled $16.7 billion over the course of 10 days. So who does this all affect? Well, originally I had it all written out that anyone under $250,000 in deposits, well, they're gonna be protected and it would be the large guys that were left holding the bag. But this is where I got it wrong because cue the bailout of the government stepping in and protecting all depositors. Now, the politicians are doing the politician thing and saying it's not a bailout, but if it smells like fish, then it's most likely fish. The FDIC insurance will now basically charge all the other banks in the system to backstop these laws. Losses. And all of those other banks will charge, well, you guessed it, folks like you and me. This is a backdoor version two of Main Street 
bailing out Wall Street. And as I mentioned earlier, this bank was a bank for the startup VC world. There were a lot of very powerful people who made very large donations that got caught up in this. There were also some companies like Roku who had 26% of their cash or $487 million in SVB. Or Roblox, which had 5% of its $3 billion in cash at SVB. Digital currencies like BlockFi and Stablecoin were also getting tangled up in this mess. Did you really think that the powerful donated class who donated to the politicians would really get caught up in all of this mess and not made whole? Come on. I knew they wouldn't and literally laughed when I saw all the YouTube videos about how the entire system was going to collapse and it was 2008 all over again. I've seen this movie before. And so have you, actually. The government stepped in and backstopped banks back then, and well, they're going to do it again. And just as a quick side note, this is why there will never be a foreclosure crisis ever again, because the government created a new precedent during COVID. I have noted many, many times that the reason real estate got hit hard in 2008 was because it was a real estate-led recession. Irresponsible practices in the industry led to irresponsible lending, which led to a bubble well, that we know all the story of. What is different and at the same time, well, the same is that this has been the tech sector and specifically unprofitable startup companies that are leading the charge for this current recession. Over the years, we saw more and more zombie companies. These are companies who have never made a profit and were able to survive on cheap debt. Well, the cheap debt, it's now gone and these companies are in great peril. Is it really a surprise at the bank that specialized banking and lending to this industry that until now didn't prioritize profits is the one that failed? Yeah, I don't think so. So how will this affect the real estate industry? Uh, it won't. The exposure to the real estate industry is in the freezing up of the capital markets and thereby lending. But history and their current actions says that this most likely will not happen. Hence my ah before my it won't. Actually, how it affects the real estate industry is by interest rates actually going down. But more on that in a moment. In 2008, the government backstopped these banks and they're going to do it again. They caused this problem and well, they kind of should be on the hook, quite frankly. They will do everything they can to not call it a bailout, but let's call a spade a spade. This is why it is absurd for people to throw out the term depression or system-wide bank failure. Remember how I mentioned the Fed buys mortgage-backed securities earlier and how they have stopped buying as they have started increasing interest rates? Well, get ready for that to change. And this is how I was wrong in my original making of this video. I thought the Fed would allow this bank to fail, then create this new program. It turns out they created this new program and at the same time decided the 16th largest bank in the US, well, they were too big to fail. The Fed, they're gonna backstop these smaller banks and really all banks by allowing them to pledge collateral. This will thereby provide the banks the liquidity that they need to diminish the ability for any future runs. How does this work? Well, remember the first shot of all of this was the $1.8 billion loss that SVB took due to selling securities to actually increase their liquidity position. My guess is the Fed's going to allow banks to just pledge that collateral to the Fed. The Fed will then give the bank the money and will be made whole as those bonds mature. It's a bailout, but in a way where Congress doesn't have to provide the banks with billions of dollars in a way that politicians can save face that they aren't bailing out Wall Street well, while Main Street suffers. But when the government is giving $1 for an asset that might be worth 60 cents, then I call it a bailout. Not sure what you're gonna call it. And that is why it won't matter for the future in regards to additional banks failing. The government knows now the problem that, well, they created, and they're gonna take actions to make sure it doesn't happen again. A couple things as it relates to real estate. Zero rate policy in the days of mortgage rates in the twos, threes, and even fours, they're gone. It's irresponsible lending practices that we are now paying a price for. They won't do it again. I hope they won't do it again. So if you're waiting for interest rates to go back down to those levels until you buy a house, then my recommendation, don't hold your breath. What this will do is create an entire new set of issues. With this bailout, the government has essentially stepped in and said, hey, there's no risk to banking. Banks can be frivolous like they were in 2008 and make those crappy bets, and the government will step in. Banks can make awful business decisions in locking a great deal of their capital in low interest rate and long-term maturities in an increasing interest rate environment, and the government's gonna step in and bail them out. 
It's good to be a bank. They obviously donate to the right people. On another note, this mess has pushed up the chances that the Fed starts quantitative easing by the end of 2023. Before this, the markets had only a 9% chance the Fed was going to cut rates in 2023. Today, those chances have soared. The markets now have fully priced in a 25 basis point cut by September. With the markets now currently pricing in the Fed most likely scenario with the Fed not increasing interest rates in the March meeting. My name is Jeffrey Chubb. Whether you're looking to buy a house in the next 9 or 90 days, then I'm your guy. All of my contact information it's in the description below but you can always go to youtube real estate agent.com and fill out your information and then i'm going to reach out to you questions or comments about any of this then please throw them in the comments section below you take the time to watch the video so i'm always going to take the time to respond so until next time the silver